Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Word from the Lord. James over here with you. We are coming to you from here in Reedsville, and we hope that you're ready for our study from God's Word. We uh, always want to uh, let you know how you can reach us, and uh, here's our content information. At uh, We meet at 250 the Boulevard, and if you want to uh, reach me, at Word from the Lord at gmail.com, 276-340-2653 is how you can reach me. And be glad to hear from you. If you'd like to study from God's Word, a personal Bible study, we'd be glad to do that very thing. Uh, any of the information we have, uh, friends, is, is free. And it may be that the information we're giving you tonight is especially important to you because it may be that you uh, are a member of the church that is putting out a track that we are going to be reviewing tonight. And so I hope that it might be especially uh, of interest to you. And it may be that you want to call someone to tell them that, hey, we're reviewing a track that, uh, uh, that y'all distribute. It's from the Tri-City Baptist Church. I'll go ahead and tell you that. Tri-City Baptist Church in Eden, North Carolina. is a track that was, uh, that was given to me. And so I thought, well, we'll just do a little review on that because I have done some information, uh, done some, uh, had some dealings with, uh, Mr. Benny Woods, who is the preacher over at Tri-City Baptist, <clears throat> and he won't talk to us. I've tried to ask him about having Bible, just having, asking Bible questions, and uh, he uh, runs like a uh, like a rabbit looking for a hole, and uh, it's just a you know just a casual conversation. It's what we just wanted to have with him, but he's not interested. But if you're interested in what we're uh, saying, I'll be glad to in, uh, answer any Bible questions you may have, and. Uh, I won't, I won't shy away from it. So if you uh, want to discuss the Bible with us or if you would like to call Mr. Benny Woods and tell him we're discussing a track that has his name on it, we'll be glad to uh, uh, take his phone call. He can call in and uh, maybe give an answer to some of the things we're saying. But let's just start with this, with this. You know, when you're talking about how to get to heaven, you want to make sure you're going in the right direction. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13-14, Matthew chapter 7, 13 through 14, that we should be sure that we're entering in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. For straight is the gate, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth uh, unto life, and few there be that find it. So sometimes when we're talking about going in the right direction we're talking about being on the right track and that's exactly what we want to do friends we're trying to uh make sure that what you are hearing is going to get you to heaven now when jesus says uh enter you into straight gate there has to be some information given you so you'll know which which road to travel you know make sure you're on the right road if you're not on the right road we'll never get to the destination and the way you get to the right road is you have the, the signposts or the guidelines that tell you how. So we want to make sure that you're on the right track. Now, it may be that you have picked up a tract, a tract, a little pamphlet, that will tell you how to get to heaven. And that information may sound good. It may even have some scriptures with it. But is it actually fulfilling the promise of putting you on the right track? So what we're discussing not is we're discussing a tract that is going to put you on the wrong track. Or maybe you need to ask a question. Maybe you want to scrutinize to see if the tract that you're reading is putting you on the right track. It may make the promise, but the question is, is it really? Is it putting you on the right track? Now, the reason I said to you at the beginning about where the track came from is because I know that there are many people that uh, might see this track, they might see this little pamphlet, this little bit of information, and they may say, you know what, this, is, this sounds pretty good. This sounds like it's putting me on the right track. Here's the actual, the actual track, how to get to heaven. And uh, it's just a real little uh, uh I say four page, it's a little pamphlet, and it's got little uh, uh, blocks, like little cartoon drawing bl uh, blocks off on it, and has little scriptures and different verses and whatever uh, information that uh, uh, 
seems to apply, but the question is, is it telling you really how to get to heaven? You know, friends, if I wanted to know how to get to heaven, I would make sure that the information that was given to me was in keeping or lining up with the Bible because I know the Bible is going to tell me how to get to heaven. I know the Bible is going to tell me the way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So if I'm going to get to heaven, I'm going to follow the man, the only person that's ever come from heaven and gone back, and that's Jesus Christ. So if I'm following a track that is promising me or telling me how to get to heaven, I want to make sure that it's lining up with what Jesus said because Jesus ultimately is the only one who knows how to get there. All right? So here we are tonight. tonight. Now this track, as I said, is put out, uh, well, it's published by a different group of people, but it's, it's stamped here, Tri-City Baptist Church, uh, there in Eden, and uh, Pastor Benny Wood, and his phone number is 336-627-1276. If you want to call him and tell him that we're discussing a track that has his name on it, I'm assuming that he wouldn't uh, mind me giving you his number because, after all, it's uh, published out here. He's putting it out here for everyone to see, 336-627-1276. And we're just going to see if this track on how to get to heaven is really putting people on the right track. Is the tract, How to Get to Heaven, that's got Benny Wood's name on it, is it telling people or putting them on the right track to get to heaven? Now, let's just start. Now, some of the things that in this track I wouldn't have a problem with. Um, and we're just going to read through, and the things that I don't have a problem with, I'll tell you that, and we might expound on a little bit. But the first little panel, and I said it's got 12 or 13 panels with it, uh, says, um, uh, what is the Bible? The Bible is God's word. It tells us his law. And here they have a picture of the Bible, and that just says King James on it. Well, that's good. I, I use the King James Version of the Bible, and it is the Word of God. I firmly believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And friends, that's a good starting point. Anytime someone is telling you what you need to do, to, or how, what you need to do, what you need to follow to get to heaven, if they're not starting with the Bible, then you're never going to get there. I wholeheartedly agree with this panel of the track that yes, the Bible is the starting point. And as a matter of fact, that's usually where I start when I'm having a Bible study with people. I want to start with, do you believe the Bible? Is it, do you believe that it's God's Word? Well, the track that we're talking about here says the law of the Lord is perfect, and it quotes Psalm uh, 19, verse 7a. Uh, so that's true. I believe the Bible is the Word of God. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, 1 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now let's stop there. The Bible is profitable for doctrine. Now some people say doctrine doesn't matter. But doctrine is just teaching. So if you're wanting some instruction, and that's what it says, instruction in righteousness, if you're wanting some instruction, or some teaching on how to get to heaven, no better source than the Bible, the inspired Word of God. It is proper for doctrine, for instruction, for reproof, and for correction. Now, let me tell you something, friends. Some, some, somebody might talk about uh, these people that put out this track. They're trying to do their best to, to get people to heaven. Well, they may be trying, but they're not trying their best because if it's trying the best, then you're going to make sure that what you're giving people is right. And if it's not, why would you be opposed for there to be some correction or for there to be some pr a reproof in it? See? Reproof is just an admonition. It's just a, is a, a chastising or pointing out an error, telling a fault, and then you have uh, the correction here. Why do you have a problem with that? If Listen, if you're going down the highway, we're going down the highway together and you're driving, and I say, well, hey, you missed your turn. You need to turn around. You missed your exit. Now, is that making you mad for me to correct you? Listen, <clears throat> uh, if we're trying to get to heaven, it should not bother you to, for someone to point out, hey, you're telling people to go a certain direction, and that is not in keeping with the Bible. That's not, that's not going on the right path. So <clears throat> why, why then would you have a problem with me telling you this? Now, the, the next panel says, what is sin? What is sin? Now, I noticed that this, this uh, little track is kind of written in a cartoon fashion. 
And uh, I may make a comment about that later on. But here it has two people. They're looking, they're looking at the Bible. And the Bible says, Thou shalt not steal. Uh, Exodus 20, verse 15. Well, there's other places in the Bible that say don't steal. Romans chapter 10. But no, nonetheless, we're talking about... I said Romans chapter 10. That's not right. But, uh, but in any case, that's true. God's word tells us what sin is. In 1 John 3 and verse 4... 1 John 3 and verse 4, the Bible says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now, if we're talking about sin, the Bible is going to tell us what it is. That is, it is a transgression, a going beyond, a missing the mark of the law of God. So God, God is telling us, God is telling us what sin is. And in this little track that we're, um, that we're reviewing, it says, basically, it says lying, stealing, cursing, uh, cheating, not obeying God is sin. Not obeying God is sin. Now, friends, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Not obeying God is sin. Now, so far, we're doing all right on this track. How to get to heaven. It starts off with the Bible being the, the, the foundation, the source of authority for God's word. And it is going to be the one that tells what is sin and what's not sin. Anything that's contrary to God's word is a sin. It's missing the mark. All right? So, so far, we're doing all right. Now, the next, the next little panel that we're going to look at here says... Will God punish sin? Now, this is a very logical progression. I like this track so far. Very logical progression. Will God punish sin? Well, the answer is yes. That is certainly right. God is going to punish sin. Now, they've got quoted up here, Psalm 9 and verse 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations that forget God, is the rest of the verse. All uh, the wicked shall be turned into hell. Friends, I don't think people realize just how bad how bad the consequence of sin really is. God is not going to look at sin and give it a pass. Now, contrary to what some people believe, that you uh, you can sin, you might sin, and and uh, even if you're not, even if you don't have a chance to repent, or you, even if you don't ask for forgiveness of it, even if you're doing it willfully, God will still allow you into heaven. The idea of once saved, always saved. Well, that kind of I kind of question about uh, that doctrine when I see that God is going to punish sin. Friends, do you realize, do you realize that there is going to be a, a great punishment one day that, uh, that we're all going to receive if we disobey God? In Luke 12, verse 48, uh, let's look at verse 47. The servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Now this is a parable that Christ is teaching, but notice what he says. He says, And he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes, for unto whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required. Uh, God is not going to allow sin to go unpunished, even though, even though he said, Well, I didn't know. I didn't know. Sometimes people say, well, what about all these people over in these third world countries, the far corners of the, of the earth, that have never heard the gospel? Right here. Right here. Those individuals who have never heard the gospel are going to be punished because they are accountable to God. That is why we have responsibility to set the record straight, to make sure the gospel goes into all the world. John tw uh, Matthew 28, 19 to 20, go ye therefore and teach all nations. All right? Uh, uh, Mark 16, 15 and 16. Preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Individuals who don't hear the gospel and believe it are going to be lost. There is going to be a great punishment for sin. And we live in a society where we like to whitewash sin. We like to wash it over or call it uh, things that 
uh, kind of soften the blow, you might say. You know, we want to call, the woman call homosexuality an alternative lifestyle. We want to call adultery and fornication. We want to call it uh, shacking up or just a uh, an arrangement. You know, we don't want to call sin what it really is. But there is a great consequence. Now, so far this track, I'm I'm right in line with it. I agree. This is a great great start to telling people how to get to heaven. Because hell is a terrible place to go. That's what the track said. Hell is a terrible place where the fire is. There is going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Bible says that it is a place that's reserved. That is reserved <clears throat> for for the devil and his angels. Look at this. In in Jude. In uh, Jude, we're going to look at verse. Um, uh, Six here, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting change unto darkness, unto the judgment of, of the and the judgment of the great day. So there's a place, there's a place that's reserved for the devil and his angels, a place of of punishment that everybody who sins is going to go, who go, who sins and does not obey the gospel, does not have those sins remitted and take care of. You do not want to spend eternity in this place. Unsaved people, the track says, unsaved people will burn in hell. Friends, that's pretty strong talk. But it's right. Unsaved people, that is people who have their sins still accounted against them. Individuals who have sin counted against them, that is their sins are not forgiven, Either they haven't had their sins washed away to start with or they haven't repented their sins. They will burn in hell. It's torments. It's torments. A picture that you that you have, now this is not even hell, but in, in uh, the picture that we have, <clears throat> excuse me, the picture that we have in Luke 16 Beginning in verse 19, Jesus gives a parable to a certain uh, rich man and Lazarus. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and, and fine linen and fared sumptuous every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of, of sores and desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dog came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was, and was uh, buried. And in hell... This is in uh, Tartarus, in torments. He lifted up his uh, he lifted up his his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and lies in his bosom. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tortured, for I am tormented in this flame. Now notice what is what is said to him. Abraham said, "Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between you and thee is a great gulf fixed, that they which pass over from thence to you cannot; neither can they pass over can they pass to us that would come." From thence, well, that would be everybody that you know that would cross if they could. And he says, "For uh, he says, then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify to them, lest they come into this place of torment." Now, friends, stop right there. We're getting a picture of what's happening after death to those individuals who are sinning, who are, who are who die in sin. Now, this is not even after the judgment. He had, this man has not even been placed in the judgment. He hasn't been cast in the outer darkness. He's just in the place of torment, waiting for the judgment. He knows his fate sealed. The final judgment on just to the degree of punishment is still reserved, but still he's in torment. Now, friends, if you think that there are no consequences to sin, please think again. Please think again, Okay. Sin is going to be punished. God will punish sin. Don't think for one minute that sin is not going to be punished. It will. Now, let's move on to the next part of the track. 
What can we do to keep from going to hell? What can we do to keep from going to a place of torments? What can we do from being punished, keep from being punished uh, in hell? Now this track says, can I save myself from hell then? I mean, they built up, the track builds up the fact that the Bible is God's word, rightfully so. That the Bible tells us what sin is, rightfully so. And the Bible tells us what the consequence of sin is. That's, ex that's exactly what needs to be done. Then it says, well, can I save myself from hell? Now the track says, no. The track says, no, no one can save himself. And then they get the verse, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Friends, that doesn't say you can't save yourself. That just makes a statement that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, we know that. That doesn't say whether you can save yourself or not. I don't know why you put that verse there. Now this tract that is that is put out by Tri-City Baptist Church or that is uh, been, being passed out by Tri-City Baptist Church, now this is where this tract kind of gets off track. This is where this tract kind of gets off track. It kind of starts veering off here. Can I save myself from hell? The tract says no. Now, friends, think about just think about the hopelessness right there of that statement. Before you even get halfway through this tract, you've been told the Bible's God's word. You've been told that the Bible, which is God's word, tells you what sin is and tells you the consequence of sin is, is hell, eternal punishment in hell. You don't want to go to hell. And then it says, well, what can I do to keep him going to hell? Can I save myself? Nope. Boy, how hopeless is it? How hopeless? There's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do to save myself from hell. The track says no. But you know what, friends? Here's the good thing. The good thing is that we have a Bible as well, and we're not depending solely upon the track that, that, uh, that Mr. Benny Woods is putting out that tells people that if they sin, there's no hope for them to save themselves from their sin. Because of what the Bible says. In Acts 2 and verse 40, Acts 2 and verse 40, on the day of Pentecost, <clears throat> Peter and the 11, other 11 apostles, are preaching, and he says, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Save yourselves. Save yourselves. Save yourselves. Don't be like everybody else. Save yourselves. <clears throat> now, friends, I don't know about you, but when someone tells me you can't save yourselves, there's nothing you can do to save yourselves, to save yourself from hell. And Peter... And the other apostles say, save yourself. Then I'm going to go with Peter. I'm going to go with the apostle who says, yes, you can save yourself. Now, this is why I'm saying this tract is getting us off track. See, man has responsibility in his salvation. Man has a part in it. Man can do something. He has to participate in order by faith to obey God. We're not talking about works that we've decided, that we've determined. We're talking about doing things that God has said do, faithful obedience to God. That's what we're talking about. In James 4, verse 8, for example, look at this. In James chapter 4, and verse 8, James 4, verse 8, <clears throat> draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. How can a person do that? You mean, you mean I can cleanse my heart by myself? That's not what he said. 1 John, 1 John chapter 1 says that the blood of Christ can cleanse us. But yet this verse says cleanse your heart. Pure, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. So what does that tell me? That tells me that even though there's a part that God plays in providing the cleansing, there's a part that God plays in, in providing the purification, there's also man's part 
in doing what God says do in order to reach this conclusion. Look at this. In Acts chapter uh, 15, Acts chapter 15, <clears throat> let's start in verse uh, 7. Peter rose up and said to the men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Uh, and God knoweth, and God knoweth the heart, uh, hear, uh, and God knoweth the heart, bear them witness, giving uh, them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. Now he's talking about Cornelius here. And put no difference between us and them, that is between Jews and Gentiles, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, how did God purify their hearts? By faith. God purified their hearts when Cornelius and the Gentiles obeyed in faith. When they were faithfully obedient to God's will, then God purified their hearts. Did they have a part in it? Yes. Did they do it all by themselves? No. But yet, they did save themselves. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20, notice this. Now we are ambassadors for Christ. This is Paul talking about the apostles. We are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Now wait a minute. You mean to tell me that man can do something to be reconciled to God? See, friends, when a track, when a track like this says that I cannot save myself, or when it tells someone they cannot save themselves, they're removing man's responsibility in the equation. Man has a responsibility. He has an obligation to do what God says. Now, it's not totally on man, it's not wholly on man, it's not completely on man, but yet man does play a part. And even though, even though he didn't devise the plan for salvation, he still has to render obedience to it. If sin separates you from God, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, then man, in obedience to God, can be reconciled to God, which is what Paul is saying here. Be ye reconciled to God. If you're away from God, then you need to come back to him. Draw nigh to him, you see? So this tract is getting us off track. If someone is reading this saying, well, how do I get to heaven? And they read this tract, they say, well, you know, this is like a dead end road. How can I get to heaven? So it starts to deviate, starts to get us off track right here. So we're trying to get us back on track. We're trying to get us back on track on how to get to heaven. you got to believe the gospel, the word of God, tells us of sin, tells us the consequences of sin, and then it also tells us, yes, you have some obligations and responsibility in your own salvation. Now, the next panel in our little tract here says this. Who can save me from hell? Well, the answer they give is Jesus can because he never sinned. Now, friends, I'm not denying that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Jesus is the one who's shed his blood to to uh, uh, pay the, the redemption or the ransom for the sins. But when you say, I can't do anything to save myself, Jesus can, but Jesus can, that puts it all on Jesus. So this tract is really veering off course now. Now it's really getting off track because it's telling people that no, you can't do anything you can't do anything to save yourself. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Now, it doesn't say only Jesus, but that's what is implied here because it says Jesus can because he never sinned. Since you sinned, you can't save yourself. Friend, that's a lie. That's veering off track. But yet, the implication is, well, you sin, therefore you can't do anything. You can't participate. You cannot save yourself. Only Jesus can. Well, friends, here's the problem. This is where you need to stop and really have some critical thinking on, on reading these tracts. 
and it will help you not get off of tra off track. All right. If Jesus is the one who can save from hell by virtue of the fact that he never sinned, this track is putting everything squarely on Jesus and taking away man's part of sal in salvation, taking away man's role in his own salvation. <clears throat> well, friends, are there some people that are going to be lost? Are there some wicked people out here who are sinning who are going to be lost? Now I would say, I would guess, venture guess, that even Benny Woods would say, yes, there are going to be some people that are lost. I've even had Baptist people tell me that I'm going to be lost, that I'm going to hell. Well, if Jesus is the only one who can save because I don't have any part of my own salvation, here's the question. If the wicked can't save themselves, then who's to blame for, for the wicked being lost? Now, we know they're going to be because the track has already told us, right? The track's already told us back here on, on panel uh, number three. Unsaved people will burn in hell forever. Now, if I'm not saved because I can't do anything about it, and it's all on Jesus... Well, who's to blame then if someone's lost? See the problem here? You see how this track starts getting off track? It's trying to tell people how to get to heaven, and they take away their, their responsibility. They take away man's responsibility and say, well, it's all on Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can do it because he never sinned. Friend, I don't deny Jesus never sinned. And I don't deny that Jesus is the one who paid the price for forgiveness of sins. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's no doubt about that Jesus is the one through whom everlasting life can be obtained. But that does not mean that I don't have some obligation, responsibility in my salvation. All right? It doesn't mean that I don't have a part in it. Otherwise, if someone's lost, it's all on Jesus. Now, friends, do you really want to believe a doctrine like that? Do you really want to believe a doctrine that says that we know there are going to be some lost people? Jesus himself said it in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, the verse we started off with. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Well, Jesus, why didn't you save them? If Jesus is the only one who can... Because they can't do anything for their own salvation, then how are all those people going to be saved? How are any of those people going to be saved? And if the if the broad way that's full of people that are entering into destruction, if they're going to be lost, whose fault is it? Friends, I'm not going to blame Jesus for the majority of the world being lost. But this tract, this tract is blaming Jesus. Well, friends, that's, we're getting off track there, see? Now, the tract says Jesus died on the cross to pay for all your sins. Romans 5, Romans 5 verse 8, Jesus Christ died for us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, friends, now we've kind of gone to the other extreme here. Does that mean that all sins are paid for now? By virtue of the fact that Jesus hung on the cross, he died on the cross for the sins of the world, does that mean that all sins are paid? Now, so just stop and think with me. Jesus died on the cross to pay for all your sins. Okay? Now, the tracks already told me that I can't do anything to save myself. Jesus is the only one who can save me because he's the only one who's sinless, and he died on the cross to pay for all my sins. So does that mean, then, that my sins are paid? 
Does that mean that I have no sin debt? Because Jesus died on the cross? I believe Jesus died on the cross. Does that mean that at that point it's when my sins are, are washed away that they're gone? At the point of Jesus dying on the cross? Now, friends, I've had people call in on this program and tell me that, that that's exactly right. They tell me, yes, Jesus died on the cross, therefore your sins are forgiven. Friends, if that's the case, then why are there wicked people? If that's the case, then why would the track spend so much time emphasizing the fact on panel three that hell is a terrible place where the unsaved are going to burn for eternity. Why even mention this? Why even mention hell? Why even mention the wicked? Why even mention the consequence of sin if Jesus paid for all our sins? Now, I'd, I'd, like to know, I'd like some clarification on this. Because it seems to me that the tract that the tract that has been put out here by Tri-City Baptist Church in Eden is getting people off track. Because it's sending a, a number of messages here. One of them is, I don't have to do anything. I can't do anything. Jesus did it all, but Jesus paid for all of our sins. Well, why am I even worried about it? Why should I even read any further? Why should I read any further? Number one. Number two, why did I have to read the part about sinners burning in hell forever to scare me when, after all, Jesus paid for the paid the price right here? Why tell me that? Why have to tell me about the sin that I don't even have to worry about since Jesus paid for it? Friends, here's the thing. Just because the Bible says there in Romans 5 and verse 8, God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That doesn't mean that his blood was applied to us when he died. Just because verse 9 says, being more than, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him, doesn't mean that we're going to be saved by virtue of him hanging on the cross. It goes back to what we said earlier. Man has responsibility in his own salvation. Man has responsibility in his in his, his salvation. He has responsibility or he plays a part in his own salvation. It is faithful obedience to what God said. God did his part in sending his son, paying a price. It is now man's part, man's part to faithfully obey what God says do in order to reap the benefits of Christ dying on a cross and thus being justified by his blood. Only justified by his blood when we obey. See that? Now, that the, the, the problem that this doctrine is, 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 is bringing up here is this. If you say that man has no part in his salvation, man cannot save himself, and that means he can't participate in his salvation at all, only Jesus can, then you put the blame on Jesus for people being lost. If you say, well, Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world, all right, now he paid the price, that means there's universal salvation. That means everybody's saved. So were all men saved? Well, no, all men are not saved. All right, so it's Jesus' fault so that they're lost. No, Jesus died on the cross and paid for the sin. Okay, so all men are saved. No, all men are not saved. There are some wicked people. All right, why are they wicked? Why are they not saved then? Did Jesus not save them? No, he saved them when he died on the cross for their sins. Okay, so he paid the debt for their sins. That's right, so now everybody's saved. No, see how it goes? You just can't have it both ways. You can't have man sitting over here going, yeah, Jesus paid for all of my sins, so I'm not a sinner anymore. And yet, if someone's lost, well, it's Jesus' fault because he didn't save them. Which is it? How about neither, friends? How about this? How about Jesus died on the cross for man's sins if 
if man will obey him and do his will. See, this track that we're reading is really getting people off track. How to get to heaven? This track is not getting you there. This track is not getting you there. Now, the next panel says, how can I be saved? Wait, wait a minute. How can I be saved? Well, you can't save yourself. Only Jesus can do that. But then it tells us what to do. It tells us something to do. How can I be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I shall be saved. And they quote Acts 16, 31. Now, friend, do you see a problem here? You talk about you talk about how to get to heaven. This is like getting instructions from, you know, the old man out in the country. He's trying to get to his house. Well, where, how do I get there? Well, you go down here to the Johnson place and you turn right. And that, then you go about, oh, I don't know, you go till you see the cow out in the pasture, and then you turn left at the old hickory tree, and then you go about a mile or so down there till you see the old windmill on the right, and then you cross the creek, but don't cross the second creek. What, are you, what kind of instruction are these? I mean, it's so convoluted. I've talked to people on the phone. They tell me how to get to their house, and they're telling me turn left, turn right, go straight. You know, do a do a 360 donut somewhere, and I'm saying, uh, how about you just give me your address, and I'll put it into my GPS, and I've got my map, and I've got a phone, and I've got a GPS, and I'll I'll find your house. You just tell me your address, friends. That's what this tract is doing. This tract is telling people so much confusing information they'll never get to heaven because they're not following the map. First to tell you, no, you can't be saved. There's nothing you can do to be saved. And they're turning around saying, Jesus is the only one that can save you. And then turn around and tell you, well, this is what you need to do to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus. See, I thought we were just told you cannot save yourselves. And now we're being told to do something for our salvation. We're being told to do something so that we might be saved. Friends, look at this. Let's look at Acts 16 and verse 31. <clears throat> the context of this the context of this is Paul and Silas have been in prison and at midnight there came a there was an earthquake right the jailer thought everybody had escaped and he was going to kill himself and Paul with a loud voice said do thyself no harm we'll all hear the jailer came in uh, he called for a light sprang in and came trembling and fell down before them Paul and Silas and said sirs what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Now, friends, the track that we're discussing here stops right here. Now, I don't know about you, but if I want directions or I'm getting instructions to a place, I don't want just partial instructions. If someone's giving me some details on how to get to their house or how to get to a, a certain place, how would you feel if they gave you half the instructions and told you that's all you had to do to get there? I live in Eden. If someone said, well, how do you get to your house, James? Well, from here... From here, you go north on Scale Street, and you'll get there. Well, good luck with that. But that's what that's what this track's doing. This track's telling us, well, here, 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 wait, right? Stop right here. Friends, the jailer did something else other than just believe in the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 32. And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. Friends, if you want to know what you must do to be saved, yes, it's going to take belief in the Lord. But here's a man who didn't know who Jesus was. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So what this man needed was, he needed to hear a word from the Lord. 
they gave him more information. And the result was, the result was, look at verse 33. And he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and was baptized. Now, why is it, why is it that our track put out by Benny Whitehead, uh, Benny uh, uh, Woods, I have a friend named Benny Whitehead, hope he didn't see this. <clears throat> He's not a Baptist preacher. Why is this track by Benny Woods only telling people to believe? when the jailer did something more than believe. So he did something more than believe. So first we're told you can't do anything. Now we're told you got to believe, which is something. And then we're not, we're only just told part of it. This tract, how to get to heaven, not getting us there. It's getting us way off track, way off track. But friends, let me say something to you. When, the, when this tract says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, after they've told us we can do nothing, you know, we can't save ourselves, and then they turn around and say, believe, you know what? Believe is a work. Now, if you want to say, well, you can't save yourself, then why are you telling someone to do a work? Why would the tract tell us on one hand, well, you can't save yourself. What you need to do is you need to do a work over here. Y'all believe in work salvation? What it sounds like. Do you know belief in the Bible is said to be a work? In John 6, verse 28, John 6 and verse 28, look at this. They said to Jesus, they said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. <clears throat> what might we do that we, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? What shall we do? Here's what you do. You believe on him whom he hath sent. That is, you believe on Christ. Now, friends, when someone says, well, you don't do anything, you don't have any part in your salvation, you can do nothing to save yourselves, and then turn around and says, well, you've got to believe in order to be saved. You're telling them to do something to save themselves. Believe. What do you think Peter in Acts 2, when he, with many other words, said, save yourselves, what do you think he just told them to do? They already believed that Jesus was the Son of God and that they had crucified him. Acts 2 and verse 37. He said, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that this same Jesus whom ye crucified, God hath made him both Lord and Christ. Verse 37 says, And when they heard this, they were preaching in their hearts. They believed it. They believed that Jesus was the Son of God. What is it to do? Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sin. Now, what do you do? You have to believe. It's something you do. Again, it shows that man has an obligation in his salvation. Hebrews 5 verse 9. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. Being made perfect, he became the author of salvation unto all them that obey him. He didn't become the author of salvation to all simply because he hung on the tree. He didn't become the, the savior of all <clears throat> simply because they believed. He became the author of salvation to all that will obey him. See there? Now you want to know how to get to heaven? You want to know how to get to heaven? You have to obey Christ. You have to, it starts with belief. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, Hebrews 11, verse 6. That's just the starting point. Now you have something else to do. Now the track goes on and says, well, you've got to repent. Now I agree with that. Now I agree with the track on, on this point about belief, that you have to believe. And I agree with the track that it says you have to repent. But what's confusing is the track tells you you can't do anything, but then you need to turn around and believe 
why not tell people you have to do something? Alright? Except you repent, shall all likewise perish. Luke 13, 3. Now again, here's an observation. For a person not being able to do anything to save themselves, this tract is giving a lot of information telling them what to do. You can't do anything to save yourself, but what you need to do is believe and repent. And that's what the tract's saying. Now, isn't it confusing, friends? Isn't it, isn't it kind of turning things around about? If you're trying to get to heaven following this tract, right, this tract that we're, that we're reviewing here, you'll never make it there. There's so much information left, up, left out, you'll never make it. It's like following one of those crazy GPSs, you know. It's like, well, turn left, turn right, and you, you double back, and you turn around and around and go in circles. Takes you everywhere but where you're trying to get. Well, that's what we're doing here. Repent. I agree with the fact that the Bible says repent. I agree with that. Paul said in Acts 17, verse 30, God commands all men everywhere to repent. So, no argument from me about the man needs to repent. What I'm confused about is why you would say, why the tract says, man does nothing. You can do nothing for your salvation, but you can and you must believe and repent. You can do nothing, but you can believe and repent. Why would you say that? Why would you say that? All right? So, no, no question about it. Man must repent. Now, here's where it really gets scary. Here's where it really gets scary. Now the track says, turn to the Lord Jesus. Ask him to forgive you and save you. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. Friends, I hear this verse a whole lot. Call the name of the Lord. That's the same as asking him to forgive you, friends. That's a bald-faced lie. People keep using that verse. That's not what it means. Ask Jesus to forgive you, and then they give this verse. See, friends, there's, there's the confusing uh, directions. Trying to get to heaven. And they tell you, well, what you need to do is ask Jesus to forgive you, but this is what the Bible says. And they want you to believe that's the same thing. That's like that GPS telling you, you need to turn left on exit on exit 101. But then it tells you, well, what you need to do is you need to exit right on exit 102. Well, which is it? I'm confused. You're giving me different instructions here. Listen, Acts 22 and verse 16 can shed some light on what it means to call on the name of the Lord. Now this tract wants to tell you that call on the Lord means to ask Jesus to forgive you. That's not what it means. Let's look how it's used in the Bible. In Acts 22 and verse 16, Saul of Tarsus is told, Why tarest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord? Saul of Tarsus is told that calling on the name of the Lord is in connection with being baptized. That being baptized is calling on the name of the Lord. That you're calling on the name of the Lord at the same time you're being baptized in order to wash away your sins. Now, no Baptist tract is going to tell you that. You know why? Because while they say they're trying to get you to heaven, they're really sending you to hell. Now, friends, that's just... That's the truth. Calling on the name of the Lord is not asking Jesus to forgive you in order to be saved. It's just not. It's just not. Now, I'll, I'll say more about that in a moment. The next panel is this. God's gift to use eternal life. That means to live with him in heaven forever. Okay, don't have a problem with that. The gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans uh, 6.23. Don't have a problem with that. It's the hope of eternal life, however. That's the thing. Titus 1, verse 2. Titus 1 and verse 2. It's the hope of eternal life. 
Right? God that cannot lie has promised before the world began the hope of eternal life. It's what God promised. And so that hope of eternal life is what God gives. Not eternal life where you never can fall. Now the next panel of this track says this. Did you turn from your sin and ask Jesus to save you? Friends, the Bible never told you to do that. The Bible never told you, turn to Jesus and ask him to forgive your sins. It never told you to turn to Jesus and ask you to forgive your sins, ask him to forgive your sins and to save you. Never never told you that. Where, where does it say that? Jesus said, pray to the Father, Matthew 6, verse 9. Please, someone show me the Bible where it says, pray to Jesus for your sins to be forgiven. Now, they'll, they'll read well, Romans 10, 13. Friends, it doesn't know what it says. It doesn't say anything in there about praying to Jesus to have your sins forgiven. Yet that's what the instructions that they're telling you, that's what they're saying those instructions mean. Friends, this is wrong. After this matter, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which is art in heaven. Friends, Jesus taught his disciples to pray. He never told them to address their prayers to him. So why would you take this track as, as the authority, instruction on how to get to heaven, and it tells you pray to Jesus? It uses verses that don't say pray to Jesus. It just tells you that's what those verses mean. But see, you've never stopped to think that you want know the Bible. Jesus never said pray to him. So why then would the track tell you to pray to him? Unless they're not giving you information. The right information. John 9, 31, the Bible says God hears not sinners' prayer. The prayer of sinners. So how is it that as a sinner, you can pray to God, or excuse me, how is it that as a sinner, you can pray, number one, which God won't hear, and number two, you're addressing to Jesus, which God certainly won't hear because you're not even addressing it to the right person. Now think about that. You're asking the wrong person for something that he can't grant, only, uh, you know, and then you're, uh, you're asking in such a way that he won't even hear. You're asking Jesus to forgive your sins? God won't, God's willing to forgive sins. He won't hear your prayer. You're asking Jesus to forgive your sins, and you're asking the wrong person. I mean, it's wrong on both counts. It's wrong on both counts. And then the track says, He said, I will give unto them eternal life, and they will never perish. Friends, this is not teaching the truth. This tract is getting you way off track. They got John 10, 28 here. John 10, 28. But friends, again, it's another misuse of the scripture. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. We talked about this last week. Friends, John 10, 28 does not teach the impossibility of being lost. See? It just doesn't do that. Man can be lost. Man can disobey God and be lost. So this tract is telling you, number one, false information on how to get to heaven, and then giving you the, giving you the belief or instilling in you a false belief that once you get somewhere, you're going to be saved, and you never got to where you wanted to be in the first place. It's getting you way off course, and then when you finally reach a destination, way over here on the boondocks, way away from where you're trying to get to, they're telling you, hey, this is where you're going to stay. Friends, if I've gone off on the wrong track, I don't want to stay. I want someone to tell me, hey, you got off on the wrong track. You need to get back over here on the right road and get to, in order to get to heaven. Now, this track is a devil's lie, friends. Let's go back to where the track first started. 
Lying, cheating, cursing, stealing is not obeying God. It's sin. Well, friends, that track that we just reviewed is nothing but a lie. It's a lie. It's telling people how to get to heaven. It's telling people that it's telling them how to get to heaven. But it's really a lie. It's not telling them what the Bible really says. It's not giving them true information. So it's a lie. And so the own track condemns itself. It says that lying is not obeying God and it will be punished in hell. And that's exactly what the individuals who obey this track, that's where they'll be. This shouldn't be called how to get to heaven. What it really should be called is how to get to hell. Because that's where they're sending people. Now friends, Benny Wood won't give a defense of this track. Not publicly. He'll tell you don't listen to us. He'll run. He'll hide. But the bottom line is, friends, this track is a devil's lie. Now, if you want the truth on how to get to heaven, you need to line it up right here with God's word. Friends, I'm out of time. I'm out of time. My phone line's up. But if you want to call me, uh, after we get off the air, you want to talk to me some other time, here's how you can reach me. Word from the Lord at gmail.com, 276 340 Friends, we want to give you this track. This is the only track on how to get to heaven. It is a word from the Lord. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.